Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I'm joined by my one esteemed co-host, Ricardo Martinez. No Jerry today, sadly. Um, but today we are interviewing the amazing Samson Mao, uh, CEO and founder of gaming company Pixelmatic and CSO of Blockstream. Uh, very short intro there, but how are you doing, Samson? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, guys. Awesome. Well, we are honored to have you uh, have you here. So, yeah, as per usual, we'll just uh, dig straight in, basically, to getting to know you. But is there is there anything you want to introduce to uh, the audience about yourself, or are you happy with the introduction I gave? Just first off, I don't want to. I'm I'm happy with it. I'm just a, a Bitcoiner, someone that loves Bitcoin and thinks Bitcoin is great. That's it. Sounds great. Well, just like the rest of us, basically. Um, okay. Well, yeah. I mean. What I usually do to start off our conversation is just kind of uh, go back kind of to the uh, the earlier days, right, in, in your life and try and get the idea of who you are, uh, what makes you tick, et cetera. So um, I saw when I was looking into you further um, that you you essentially, I guess we'll start from after uni because uh, that makes kind of a lot of sense. I feel like a lot, a lot of time we don't really start our lives to we're 18-ish anyway. Um, so you got your degree. You worked at Relic Entertainment then BTC China, then Ubisoft, I think. I might maybe wrong there. Um, uh, I think it was uh, Relic, then Sitemasher, then Ubisoft, and then BTC China and Pixelmatic at the same time. Oh, yeah, more or less the same time. Gotcha. Okay. So, well, <laughs> there's a lot going on there, like <laughs> kind of as, as you've uh, made clear. Um, so you've kind of uh, yeah bounced around between uh, crypto gaming and kind of juggled two at the same time as well, obviously with working at Blockstream and Pixelmatic right now. Um, I guess the first question, um, when it comes into like working in gaming in the, in the uh, earlier times to, than now, like Relic and, and Ubisoft, like what was it like working at those companies? Um, and especially compared to what you're doing now with running your own uh, gaming company? Well, I think uh, working at both of those companies, there's a lot more... Um... Uh, structure and bureaucracy, I guess, to put it in a, a nice way. Um, being able to uh, run my own company like Pixelmatic, there's a lot more freedom in terms of what you can do creatively and just in terms of innovation, raw innovation. So we are able to do a lot of cool things that I think a traditional game company would not do, like replacing their game currency with a crypto token or making uh, assets in the game NFTs. I think there's a, a lot of traditional thinking in the game industry, and there's not that much uh, willingness to explore and change things. Um, even not touching the crypto stuff, uh, we're doing a lot of innovative stuff on the game side too. Like we're rolling out a directed narrative. This is basically a game story where you are writing the story. It's not pre-scripted. There's no um, quest that you go out and kill 10 things and collect 10 pelts or something boring like that. Uh, but it's just a, a way that we plan to operate the game where it's a, a blank slate. There is a story, but it's you, the players that are driving that story in a way. I don't know if you guys play Dungeons and Dragons, but it's kind of like we are the, the dungeon master and we're crafting that story just for you guys. Um, but yeah, like uh, Relic and Ubisoft, they're very big companies. They're very much uh, ingrained in making franchise releases, you know, like... Uh, Company Heroes 1, 2, Dawn of War 1, 2, 3, and then for uh, Ubisoft, Assassin's Creed, you know, they're just cranking out those franchises where we're trying to build something totally new and never done before. Yeah, it definitely seems like kind of different um, focuses, as you say, like with them just cranking out the same things that kind of sell, they've got no known names anyway, and you can kind of innovate more. Um, it's a cool idea, like the whole like narrative, because I, I always like remember playing... Um, like not uh, not Skyrim. What was one before Skyrim? I can't remember now. Oh, it's going to wind me up. But anyway, I used to play uh, Skyrim and its pre predecessor and Fallout Three and all these things for, for so long. I always loved that you kind of pick a storyline, but it wasn't really you know fully. But for that for, for that then it was quite cool. Um, and I always wondered like what would happen if you could kind of just pick you know hundreds of different storylines at different points rather than just one or the other or maybe three. Um, so it sounds awesome. Yeah. Well, Mass Effect tried to do that too. I guess you're a gamer, but you know they tried to let you choose your your story, right? But the outcome is the same. So even if you picked like from one, two, and three, uh, at the end it's still the same ending, which is not very interesting in my view. Um, ours is more open ended. It's kind of a cross between, I guess, that kind of a thing and a sandbox. So 
we'll kind of go in the direction that the players want to go in and we'll explore that direction. But if they like meet some other objective on the board, then we'll start panning out the story in that other direction. I love it. Sounds, uh, sounds good. I uh, definitely interested myself. Uh, yeah, I used to used to be a big gamer, less so these days because I spend more time messing around with Bitcoin, but uh, I still still do occasionally. Um, I guess like uh, to kind of switch the conversation a little bit into the crypto direction, I'm probably going to find myself flopping back and forth quite a lot. But um, so obviously you, you've discussed, well, you came across Bitcoin, obviously, um, and then you ended up working in the, the industry. So you see China and Blockstream. What, um, I guess, because obviously you're, you're working in the gaming side of things. What was it that made you decide to kind of make this, not necessarily switch, but, you know, this decision to go, I'm going to actually work in Bitcoin and, and take that extra step to get involved in the industry and, and kind of make a difference? What was it that kind of clicked for you when maybe when you discovered Bitcoin or what was it that made you make that decision? Because it's quite a big leap if you're already successfully in the gaming industry. So what was it that kind of made you make that change? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So when I first discovered Bitcoin, that was while I was... Um... I just started up Pixelmatic. I think I read about it in 2013, which was kind of late still by, by standards, uh, but for OGs. But um, I read about Bitcoin mining and that just kind of triggered, um, really triggered my interest in it because I had heard about it before that, but more tangentially, like, you know, Bitcoin's used for buying drugs or whatever. But when I read about the mining, that's when it was um, really keyed in that this is very unique because it is decentralized that, um, it's not just money controlled by one party, but anyone can participate, uh, mine Bitcoin and secure the network. And there's just no barrier. So for me, that was really what uh, was the aha moment where I thought, okay, this is really novel and interesting. And when the opportunity came up to be a part of BTC China, I just thought, okay, well, I probably should take that opportunity and, and uh, get more involved in it. And uh, from there, the rest is history. A lot of Bitcoiners don't like NFTs and crack jokes about them and stuff, but you mentioned in, in your gaming company that you see a role for them, like in the future of gaming. Um, do you see like Lightning being integrated or do you see um, it being more like each game will have their own kind of virtual currency? Well, I think there is a way to use Lightning. So uh, we're heavily using the Liquid Network for all of our blockchain tech in, in Infinite Fleet. So the game currency is a liquid asset. Um, in Liquid, uh, we can talk about Liquid more in a bit, but uh, Liquid has stable coins. It's got uh, other games that are building on it, like Light Knight. Um, it's got uh, NFTs, like uh, we launched Rare Toshi. It's an art website focused on Bitcoin-related art that is making NFTs on Liquid. Uh, but you can pretty much do anything on Liquid. So we're using that to issue our game currency. And we're also using that, that to do the NFTs for the ships. But there is a purpose here. Um, I think you could argue that games are a stronger use case for NFTs than just artwork, right? Um, and art NFT is more like a certificate. And there are use cases like enforcing royalties on it. But for a game, what we hope to do is uh, allow players to do atomic swaps. So you can basically trade in the marketplace and every trade is actually an atomic swap. So if I'm trading with you, Ricardo, um, I have INF currency and you have a ship that I want, then when we do that trade, it's a trustless exchange. So it's either executed all at once or not at all. And this can prevent a lot of things like scamming. So if you even decide to not use our marketplace, but just like, you know, move your INF to an external wallet, like um, uh, side swap, and move your ships to side swap, then you can actually use side swap to swap too. Um, and you're not reliant on one provider, right? So it's kind of facilitating that um, disintermediation where there's no single point of failure because all of these assets are now tradable on the liquid chain. And I think the, the benefit here is that really it facilitates that trustless trade, but also you can have new dynamics. So if you played like a lot of MMO games with guilds, you know that people will try to infiltrate a guild and get access to the guild bank, right? And then they'll, they'll loot the bank. Then there's a famous instance of this happening in EVE Online. But with the INF as the game currency and as a crypto token, you could set up a multi-sig wallet with the, the, the guild treasury members, right? And then no one can loot the guild. So there's a lot more interesting things that are possible now. And this opens up uh, a lot more of that to discovery by players. And it's interesting to see what they will do with it.
That's pretty cool. Because you mentioned the uh, liquid sidechain and um, obviously that's something that Blockstream has like a big part in um, uh, from my understanding anyway. I mean, I, I know a lot more about the Lightning Network than I do the liquid uh, chain. Obviously, I like the basics, but it'd be cool if for people uh, listening, if you could kind of give like a, a sort of nice summary overview of, of what it is, how it works. Um, I think I'm sure people will be interested to hear from yourself. So liquid is a Bitcoin sidechain. So a sidechain is really a blockchain without a native currency. It's anchored to another chain. So for Liquid, we're anchored to Bitcoin. Um, there's a lot of blockchains out there, you know, and they all have their own native, native currency that they either sold through an ICO or some form or fashion. But Liquid, the native currency is Bitcoin. It's Bitcoin locked up on the Bitcoin chain and unlocked in Liquid. So you have LBTC. And LBTC is what you use to pay for fees in the network. And of course, you can use it to transport liquid Bitcoin itself very rapidly between exchanges. So if someone wanted to move uh, funds from Bitfinex to BitRefill, they could use liquid once BitRefill supports liquid, then that would be uh, about one minute to confirm that transaction because we have one minute blocks. You also have the added benefit of privacy because liquid has confidential assets and confidential transactions. So when you're sending from Bitfinex to BitRefill, that is not a, a transaction that can be monitored and tracked. Um, you can also do it with stable coins too. So you could send USDT to pay a bit refill invoice as well. Um, and we've also done some work to kind of integrate the two things, liquid and lightning. So you can actually have a lightning network spun up on top of a liquid asset. So if you think of Bitcoin as having only one asset type, which is Bitcoin, uh, we have uh, liquid Bitcoin and we have USDT, uh, Canadian dollar stablecoin, Japanese yen stablecoin, and also game currencies like INF. But each one of those things, if there's enough liquidity, they can each have their own lightning network. So then you would enable free and instantaneous transactions for any liquid asset, so long as people have it and you can route through the network. So I think I missed talking about that on your earlier question, but that's the kind of follow up too. But um, for a game currency that's using liquid, you can also have a lightning network. So Right now, the model is um, we probably do similar to a, a mining pool payout. So um, you'll get batch transactions after you earn INF uh, because INF is earned, not bought. But you'll get that once a day or something like that. But if we have uh, lightning support for liquid assets, then we could stream those to you over an INF lightning network. So that's where things get really cool. You have uh, frictionless, free moving uh, cheap transactions. How does Elements differ from Liquid? So Elements is the fork of Bitcoin. Liquid is the, I guess, the branded version of it, the first the, the first live production network based off of Elements. So Elements is just the, the code base. And then Liquid is the, the product. You could say that. So I guess like... Um... Because obviously, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think what situations, what like in what situations you'd want to choose. I guess you don't have to go lightning versus liquid, as you've kind of said already. You can have liquid um, uh, the side chain with like tokens, etc., like LBTC that you then uh, use on the lightning network as well. Um, but I guess like if you were trying to say one or the other, um, I guess what what situations? I, I imagine there's some element of centralization to the liquid side chain. Uh, is that is that correct? Or I, I'd guess so, right? Like. Uh, yeah. People argue Lightning's slightly centralized as well. Um, so I suppose there's, there's going to be elements of it compared to the, well, to the main layer. Nothing is as decentralized as Bitcoin main layer, layer one. Um, there's trade-offs to get to layer two, but there's also benefits that come with those trade-offs. And I like to say you should use the right tool for the right job. If you're transacting large amounts, like Liquid was originally launched for facilitation of exchange to exchange transfers, like saying moving from... Uh, Bitfinex to OKX to uh, BitMEX or something like that, where you're sending like 20, 30 uh, liquid Bitcoins, right? Uh, and that is something you can't really do on Lightning because you need to route. Lightning is better suited for small payments. And of course, the threshold is increasing as the, the Bitcoin price is moving up, right? We can route bigger and bigger payments in dollar terms. But still, like you, you'll never be able to route you know, hundreds of Bitcoin through the Lightning network. And it may not make sense either because lightning is essentially uh, uh, lightning wallets are hot wallets, whereas for liquid you can have hot, warm, and cold wallets. Just the same as any exchange uh, infrastructure, right? I can receive the liquid Bitcoin, move it to cold storage, move it out when I need to uh, send to users or whatnot. But 
there it, it's more akin to the standard model where the exchanges are used to um, storing their coins in different um, varying degrees of security uh, and isolation. So, you know, Lightning is great, and Lightning and Liquid would probably probably be even better um, because uh, there are benefits to having Lightning networks on top of Liquid because the block times are every minute, and the fees are lower, and um, channel closes will be more predictable. So I think it's a kind of a, a, a both of them will be used in the future. It's just a, a matter of when, not really if. And I think wallets will end up supporting, um, you know, main chain, uh, lightning on main chain, and then liquid, and then lightning on liquid assets. And then we can probably handle a lot of uh, channel rebalancing and things like that and make that more automated for end users so that for them, using Bitcoin is just a, a seamless experience without any hassles or complexity. If we had like 20 different assets on Liquid and they all have their own Lightning network, are they able to do like atomic swaps between each Lightning network for each asset? Yeah, I think um, there has been some experimentation with that. I, uh, I think Litecoin had a Lightning network at some point too. And they did some um, swaps between the two Lightning networks. But I think it's totally possible to do that if there's enough... Uh, users and liquidity for each network. Okay, so I, I guess, yeah, I understand. It feels like to me, uh, the the I guess the overall aim or the perfect future would be, as you say, so that you'd have a wallet that accepts all like Lightning, Liquid, Main Chain, maybe other stuff, who knows? Um, but yeah, you'd kind of use your 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 Lightning for your you know, your Starbucks or whatever, your coffee in the morning. Um, your your Main Chain and, and, and Liquid would kind of be either for more retail investors or just your bigger moves, basically. Um, or even uh, kind of as you said, like experimenting with different things. So there's obviously there's the NFT space. So I saw like I think it was uh, the first I saw uh, the use of Red Toshi was. Um, Vlad Costea has like his um, magazine he's done and he's been using it. And I, I thought it was a pretty cool um, idea um, to do that. Uh, when I first saw you doing an FT, I thought, wait, what? Like a Bitcoin guy that I spoke to is doing it. I was, I was, like, I was really like taken aback at first. And then I realized, okay, and it's not on like Ethereum or Solana or something. It's on uh, the Bitcoin side chain, which, which makes more sense. Yeah. Um, if you look at like the reasons why I think Bitcoiners don't like NFTs, I think a large part of it has to do with Ethereum poisoning the well. Like the, the NFTs on Ethereum are just so scammy and, and ridiculous that it just makes you laugh at the entire concept. Um, whereas if you look at Rare Toshi, it's more like a community. It's artists posting their Bitcoin art. It's not copy paste uh, or ripped from the internet or it's not stupid like a, a rock. You know, <laughs> There's actually some, some art in it. And I think uh, we built up a healthy ecosystem where you know we have artists listing stuff, we have people buying the art because they want to support the artist. A lot of the art comes with the physical piece as well. So the NFT is like a, a certificate of ownership for your physical piece. I bought um, a piece called uh, Adam Back from Cypherpunk Now, and it's the 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 line is called the Cypherpunks of the World. And I think my piece is coming soon, but you know it's pretty cool that I have the NFT and I have the physical art as well. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's exactly something that Vlad was doing. And I think you're right with the NFT space. It's one of the things when I first heard about it, I don't know, it must have been ages ago. I think I had an NFT without realizing it back in like 2019, 18 or something. I had some like random things I've got for PP, but uh, that was years ago. But um, I, when I first heard about it and actually understood what was going on, it must have been in... I don't know, uh, 2020 sometime. Um, I, I, immediately, I thought, what well, a great idea. You know, you can do like uh, artists can actually get back for the, for the first time ever in history, probably they can actually start getting paid while they're alive, at least. Um, and, you know, things like music, potentially, you can have like, you can own the first copy of a song by an artist or whatever. But um, then it's things that you see, uh, there's these like crypto punks or whatever they were called on, on Ethereum. And then someone just created an exact copy of each one on Solana and was like, you know, we're just going to, and people were outraged and they were like, oh, we're going to go do a copyright battle and everything. It's like, you don't own the drawing just because you have the NFT, you know, and it kind of ex exposed that issue. So I think I like the idea of what you're doing with like creating like a smaller community that's going to grow more naturally and not just for the sake of making money, but more for like, hey, this is good art. I'm going to support it. It's a certificate. So I think it's a pretty, pretty cool idea. I don't Argue. know. If you're going to be able to answer this, because it's probably like BTC pay server where you don't know how many people are actually running them. But um, if there was a catastrophic failure to the Internet, are there enough uh, Blockstream satellite nodes for Bitcoin to survive? Well, the Bitcoin 
a satellite network is more about redundancy. So those are being served by nodes that we are running, uh, blockstream is running. So those, the, the transactions are being broadcast up and then back down. Um, I mean, it's good for redundancy. I don't know if it's good for catastrophic failure. Um, I still think you need a lot of people having their own nodes if we were, were to need to reboot the network after some major catastrophe, but definitely Blockstream Satellite could help keep that network uh, in sync and it could bootstrap, help bootstrap that new, ne new network after the apocalypse. It's clear to me that you're a guy who's pretty knowledgeable about both the gaming industry and the crypto industry and probably other things as well, to be honest. Um, I mean, I, I have two different jobs within the crypto industry and I find that pretty difficult to like change the hat and, you know, juggle different things. And, uh, but obviously you're working in two entirely separate industries, uh, but not only that, you know, you're doing it with quite a lot of success. So I guess my, uh, my question here is like, hey, have you got any tips? Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Like, what's uh, tell me the secret sauce? I guess is my is my question. Well, I think um, I'm trying to bridge the two industries. Um, knowing how the game industry works, knowing the inner workings of you know how game developers and publishers think, uh, I think that gives me an edge, and I can figure out ways that we can kind of disrupt the status quo. So. I guess you could look at um, Infinite Fleet and all of the stuff that Pixelmatic and Exordium are doing uh, is taking the tech that Blockstream has built and trying to apply that to the game industry in a meaningful way. Um, so like we talked about, it's facilitating trade, um, making new models for players to manage their own assets like multi-sig wallets. And this, this all plugs into a lot of the ecosystem that we're trying to build up uh, at Blockstream. Like, you can get a Jade hardware wallet and store your NFT on that, right? And, and that would potentially help with some of the issues that the NFT space is facing. Like, you know, the, the, they're, they're using MetaMask or whatever and they get hacked and they lost their art collection or, or whatever, right? So I think there's better ways to do it. And for us, we'll just tightly keep integrated with pretty much everything Blockstream is building because I think a lot of the stuff that Blockstream is building is really foundational and really secure. So it's a way to apply that technology to a new industry, I believe, in the correct way. And also, it's a opportunity to really test the limits of that tech too. So we can potentially be one of the first to try streaming uh, INF tokens over a Lightning Network, right? To have a, a major Lightning Network for a non-Bitcoin asset at the base. But uh, advice, I think, is really just keeping your eyes open and looking for opportunities <clears throat> like we like to say at Blockstream, we're rebuilding the future of finance. Uh, we're building a financial, new financial system on top of Bitcoin. And if you're building something completely new on a new base tech, there's just a ton of opportunities at your disposal. So one of the other things that we started pushing at Blockstream that I initiated, uh, I think in 2018, was doing security tokens on Liquid2. And again, like with a with Infinite Fleet, we're trying to raise capital using a security token and we've met with uh, pretty good success. Blockstream itself has launched the Blockstream mining node, which is a security token that is securitized with uh, our hash rate. And that's also quite popular as well. But you can just see like there, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with this new technology that isn't just scamming people with ICOs <laughs> and rock NFTs, right? You can actually apply it in meaningful ways. Uh, and I, I think the there's just a, a lot of things you can do. Okay, so I guess like you're, because so on a working day, you're kind of part of your brain and part of your time is like, hey, how are we building these cool new sort of ideas around Bitcoin on Bitcoin? And then it's kind of like the second part is like, well, okay, we've built this awesome thing. How do we then use this to further what we're doing in the with our games and the game industry and, and on the separate? So I guess they kind of mesh together uh, and it's less of a kind of break in your, in your in your brain where you're trying to sort of go to these two different worlds. Um, that's kind of a cool yep. way to cool way to look at it actually i guess like when it comes to um what you guys are up to at pixel Maddox, like um because if you look at uh what the games you guys have done is is, a, is an mmo style game and it's, and it's the first non-mobile game is that correct that you guys have done um yeah it's the first non-mobile game that pixel Maddox has done but for most of us we've done like uh pc games in the past so it's not really a big departure it's just 
when I started Pixelmatic, our main focus was on doing mobile games because that was the rage back in you know, 2011. Um, how does it differ making a mobile game to making a larger, fully fledged sort of Windows operating system game? Like, because obviously they're both computers technically, but how how is it? How does it differ? Like, is it is there are there a lot of similarities or? A lot, a lot of differences, I guess. Like, what's the, is it different, like, kind of a beast, basically, uh, to make? Yeah, well, I guess the biggest constraint is just the the size of the game. Um, if you're building for desktop, you can make things a lot bigger, whereas for mobile, you're typically trying to constrain yourself in terms of download size, and that puts additional limitations on, you know, how much stuff you can have in there, um, how complex the game can be and how high res the art can be because if you're aiming for mobile you're trying to aim for a very big audience across a vast array of devices and, and types of devices so you kind of have to kind of play towards a lower common denominator whereas i mean there are exceptions to that rule there are games that aim for very high end but i i don't know you know how viable that is because for mobile games you really need to aim for market share so for us, like the, the scope of the game, I think is better suited for desktop um, because we want to build a very vast world. Like it's basically we're replicating the entire galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy in the game. So we need, uh, we need a lot of stuff in there. And I don't think you get that level of immersion in an MMO that you, you can get on the desktop in a mobile, mobile frame uh, framework. <clears throat> But we do want to have both components. So for mobile, we'll probably do a companion app because a big part of the game is base building. So if you think of um, uh, RTS games like StarCraft, a lot of Infinite Fleet is inspired by RTS. You're kind of uh, resourcing, building, and fighting at the same time. And we wanted to kind of uh, separate those things. So you resource and you build on your downtime. And potentially that could be done on your phone. And then when you want to play and experience that cinematic combat, that's when you go to your, your desktop, right? So I think we can have the best of both worlds, which is, you know, you go to your desktop for that really immersive uh, experience where you're, you know, watching this beautiful battle vista. One of the things that we wanted to, to achieve was to uh, basically give you much more of that kind of Star Wars uh, vibe, right? Like when you go and watch Star Wars and you see the battle over a planet, that's kind of what we want to deliver at the end of the day. And I think that's the only format where we can do it um, on the PC. But then the other parts we can do on the phone. So you can manage your bases, manage your upgrades and resourcing and trade on your phone when you're you know, out and about or at the office. Yes, yeah, so like your commute to work, you can do like the other, the other bits or whatever. And then like you're waiting to get home to then play the full experience. That's pretty cool. Um, well, having said that, they've got that new Steam machine coming out uh, sometime, I think next year. That'd be pretty cool to see if you can run it on on that. And then it's like kind of almost the full mobile, like a uh, Nintendo Switch dream when it comes to like uh, computer gaming. That'd be uh, pretty yeah. awesome. What would be the thing that you're like most proud of being involved in? Because obviously there's there's probably a lot of things that excite you in both the gaming and crypto and blended industries. So what would you say is like the thing that you're like, hey, this is awesome. Like I, I'm glad I brought this thing into the world. Well, I'm glad I'm bringing Infinite Fleet into the world. <laughs> um, it's in alpha now and it will be in beta next year, but that's basically my baby. Uh, it's stuff that I've been thinking about for probably the past uh, five years. And now it's beginning to materialize. So it's uh, something I'm very proud of. And I'm really proud of the team behind it as well. We've got a lot of uh, superstar developers. So uh, we have Jason Lee. He's the uh, chief creative officer at Pixelmatic, but he was the lead designer on Age of Empires 4. And we have Wayne. He was also from the Age 4 team. He was the art director there. Now he's our art director. And we've got a ton of talent across the board. So I'm really excited for Infinite Fleet. But I guess um, in the Bitcoin space, uh, I think my biggest biggest contribution was during the block size wars and helping fight off the uh, the big blockers and the B cashers. And I think that's something I'm pretty proud of. Yeah, no, that's, that's quite cool. I, I like the, the two kind of different things. That, uh, one is like a sort of creation and one is like kind of a uh like a not a rebellious stand but you know what i mean kind of like uh imagining as like a general or something like fighting off a fighting <laughs> off a, an attack <laughs> i guess uh, in one situation and then kind of like a an architect in the other situation i've noticed in uh some of these other games that have uh, implemented their own token 
that there's been a phenomenon where people in developing economies are earning more playing the game than they would like at a minimum wage job in in their economy. Um, do you think that you're going to see a manifestation of that phenomenon with infinite fleet? Um, potentially, like people like to lump us in with the play to earn or blockchain games or game five category. And I, I think, you know, it's it's a fair assessment because you can technically earn INF. Um, it's not something that we're telling people like this is going to be valuable. It's just like World of Warcraft gold, right? <clears throat> it could be valuable if the there is demand for it, but it's not something we're going out and promising. And I think the key thing for us is that we're not selling uh, INF. It's meant to be just earned from social activities and participation in raids or other big events. So, you know, it's definitely possible it'll be valuable. And someday you could uh, trade your INF for a Starbucks card on Bitrefill, right? <laughs> but um, uh, I think there is opportunity there for people to earn. Like they could um, buy a ship, level it up and sell it to someone else. And they'd be trading their time for money to another player. And I think that's kind of what we wanted to do is um, democratize that entire aspect of the game. Like most games, they don't want you to do that. It's a, I, I don't know, they want to lock you into their ecosystem, but in the end, like players will find a way to trade anyhow. Even if you deny that in the systems of the game, there's always a way around it. Like technically you can't buy and sell wild gold. But, you know, obviously there's ways to do it because people do do it. <laughs> and I, I know, even though developers at Blizzard, that they themselves have bought WoW Gold too. So it's kind of weird, you know, like the, the official stance is we don't want you to do these things, but then you know, even the, the developers at the company are doing them. So we think it's better from an ideological standpoint to just embrace the secondary market and accept that people are going to trade their time for, you know, virtual currency or items. Why are these things that, other gaming companies aren't doing, I guess is my question. And kind of like, because I'm trying to think what advice would you be giving to, you know, the guy running the ship at Ubisoft, for example? Um, do, do you think it's just because these these bigger companies are like more profit-driven machines and they kind of have to generate X amount of, of revenue or so they can't really take the time to innovate and they've just got to go with, hey, this works, this is going to make us money, let's get this out there? Um, or or what, I guess, what is it that you, you think isn't getting these guys to do what, what you're doing? Is it maybe they don't have a, a, as good understanding of Bitcoin as you do? Because obviously you've got that advantage of being involved in, in the space. And, and I, I guess, so yeah, what, what is it do you think that is, is, is giving you that kind of advantage to be able to do this? There's a, a couple of questions packed in there. I guess the, the first one is game companies are very risk averse. Um, they don't like, like, this is why you have the sequels. And this is kind of why the RTS genre has not changed in, I don't know, 20 years. It's like the same formula. You have a single player campaign, a multiplayer campaign, and you have, you know, advances in graphics and physics and everything. But the, the, the core loop is really the same. You know, it's the same thing over and over and over. And I, I think it, it's just general risk aversion because they know they, if they have this IP, they can sell, you know, the fourth or fifth iteration of it and people will buy it because there's nostalgia. There's no forcing function to say, we need to change it up and we need to be different. Um, and I, I guess uh, a lot of the game companies, there are public market, right? So they have, they have accountability to their shareholders in a way that you know, gives them even more pressure to deliver, right? The, the, the pressure when you get to that size is to make sure like, I don't know, the fifth version of this franchise generates this many hundreds of millions of dollars, right? It's not really about what you're doing in the franchise or how the gameplay works. It's more about this whole, whole block of thing, like how much revenue does this generate, right? That's the kind of thinking that typical game company executives are really processing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and it, it gets kind of far removed. So you have the business side very distant from the development side, right? And there's often content there between you know budgeting and experimentation over you know proven tried it tried and tested business models that will yield a, a certain ROI on their investment in the game. So I, I think that is where the opportunity is. Like for us, we're very small, we're very scrappy, and it's really the the players that have enabled us to to undertake this experiment because they're investing in the game. And a lot of our backers also are from the, um, you know, the cryptocurrency and Bitcoin space, right? We have um, uh, Charlie Lee, he's an investor, Phil Potter, 
uh, Tether has invested, uh, but it's a lot of crypto people, crypto companies that are enabling us to do this. And I think they can understand there is this intersection, like Paulo from Bitfinex, he was a game developer before Bitfinex actually. So I think he can see what we're trying to accomplish here and the, the ground we're trying to break. I think I saw like a few little clips uh, of how the game uh, looks. And I was thinking, you know, the ideas you're coming up with here are awesome. So I'm just kind of like, why, why is no one else, I mean, like, why is no one else trying to do it? As you said, you're a, you're a smaller company and, and you're scrappy and you've got the ideas. So I'm thinking, you know, normally when someone has an awesome idea and they're working on it, some big juggernaut tries to ruin it with some crappy, uh, you know, like fake kind of version where they've taken the ideas and made it like, uh, you know, kind of like an EA version of something. <laughs> like they just made it behind like 50 billion paywalls or whatever. Um, so I was just wondering why they hadn't. But I guess yeah. I, I think, as, as you're saying, there's, there's risk in it. Um, and I guess also, potentially a lack of knowledge too, right? I suppose that like they don't necessarily know about. I think there's another, another part of it too, now that I think about it, it's like a lot of it has to do with me being in the Bitcoin space. So a lot of my thinking has been heavily influenced by Bitcoin, right? And uh, open permissionless systems. And I think the, the argument for Bitcoin is the freest money wins. And Bitcoin is the freest money, right? It's permissionless. Anyone can use it. It's uh, uh, everyone has equal footing in the network. Everyone can run their own node and they, you just can't compete with any fiat currency because those are centrally managed. And that also extends to a lot of altcoins too, which are also centrally managed. So the freest money will win. And if you take that kind of thinking, then the freest game will also win too. The one that has fewer restrictions on what you can do with your, your stuff, right? And I don't think that line of thinking is just going to exist at the big game companies because unless they're Bitcoiners as well, they won't see that. But uh, if you have a choice, like invest years of your life playing an MMO game, do you want to play you know, Infinite Fleet where you can pretty much do anything you want? You can self-custody your own assets. Um, you know, We can't freeze your account and freeze your currency, right? Um, or do you want to play some big game from a big game publisher where they'll ban you and you lose everything at once, right? So I, I think the market will make a choice here. And I think once the market has made that choice, the big players might start to reevaluate their positioning and thinking. But right now, they're just so comfortable. There's no need for them to do anything. They'll just keep on bringing in the money. And also with uh, COVID and the pandemic, you know, that has boosted the revenue of a lot of game companies. So I don't think they're really... They're really, they really need to think about anything um, in terms of the, the base modeling of how they, they build their games and monetize their games. There's a lot of people that I speak to as well, just in my own life, you know, you can see how Bitcoin has changed the way they think or has changed their lives. And people often credit Bitcoin to being like a, a big thing for them. But I, I guess for yourself, it's, it's kind of very, very differently done that because it's kind of changed the way you're viewing an entire different industry in, in, in gaming, something quite creative and is, and is sort of letting you see it from a different way and try different new things. Um, so I think it's pretty interesting to see that actually, like how that's, how that's changed you and changed the games that you guys are creating and uh, the impact you're going to make to that industry and that world. Um, it's, it's pretty cool. I noticed some parallels uh, with the innovation that you're implementing in Infinite Fleet with um, kind of like the innovation that you're doing by creating new financial instruments with Blockstream, like the mining note, which you mentioned, and uh, the se security tokens. And then also to talk about uh, Paolo, who we just recently interviewed, um, Bitfinex is doing like a security token, uh, like exchange edition where they're going to be using liquid and like lightning over liquid and some of the other things that you've been talking about. Um, are you guys like facing any sort of uh, barriers from regulators or anybody, you know, trying to stop you guys from innovating like this? Um, not really. I mean, securities are, you know, old an old concept they're nothing new um I, I think like the regulators do want you to do regulated offerings they don't want you to do an ico right so if you go to them and you say you know we're doing a security token for a game publisher you know they look at it we have to educate them on some things like you know what is liquid what is the bitcoin sidechain and how does that technology work but after they get past that hurdle it's you know, it's not a big deal. So for the Infinite Fleet's um, security token, it's called EXO. There's two, one for the EU and one for the US. 
The EU token, we've done that through Luxembourg with our partner Stoker. So they are, you know, fintech wizards and they helped us navigate that regulatory landscape and create the prospectus. But we've been able to have uh, retail investors uh, in Europe invest in Infinite Fleet. And just recently we announced, I think a week ago, that Baffin has uh, allowed, uh, has given us the green light to let German retail investors invest too. So I, I don't think that regulators are against security tokens. They're, they're very much for it. Um, and I think if you go the regulated route, you're probably going to have a lot less risk for your project because if you did an ICO or IEO or something along those lines, there's always that risk factor that the regulators will come after you later. Even if you say, well, we're selling a utility token, like, you know, good luck. <laughs> if you're creating a company to kind of increase the value of that utility token and you're promising things like exchange listings, then it's probably a security. Yeah, we've seen how well that's uh, going so far with Ripple, for example, um, with the sort of the pain coming down the line. Um, it's pretty cool, actually, that because I would have imagined that for some reason, I would imagine that regulators would be kind of, you know, they'd see the word Bitcoin or something and kind of panic and like uh, hit the red button or whatever. But um, it seems like that's not the case. Um, I guess like a question that's a bit more general, but because um, obviously you're, you're, you're clearly excited about the game, which makes sense. As you said, it's your like child almost of this of these last five years. And so that makes a lot of sense. And you're obviously doing a lot of new things too. I guess what in the, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be anything that's, that's block stream related, but obviously, you know, great if it is, but what, 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 what in the world of Bitcoin, I guess, is um, is like the most kind of exciting to you right now, like uh, out of projects that maybe you're working on or not working on, but like what kind of stands out to you as something that's like, hey, I want people out there listening um, to, to know like this is going on because it kind of makes me feel like a child kind of thing, you know, it excites me. Like, what would you say that that would be? I, I would still say it's lightning on top of liquid. I think the potential there is really limitless. Um, I think... Lightning on Liquid will enable things like machine-to-machine uh, -machine payments in a real decentralized fashion, right? You know, there's there are altcoin projects out there that try to say that they're 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 solving that use case, but I think Lightning is actually Lightning on Bitcoin and Liquid assets is probably the real application of that technology in that space, where you know you can have different microservices talking to other microservices and paying each other. Um, I think there's the potential for real decentralized chat and communications, uh, leveraging the Lightning Network. And I think uh, Sphinx Chat is a very interesting thing in my book. You guys should probably talk to them, but they're building a chat app uh, that's based on Lightning. So, you know, uh, even the, the apps that we have today, you know, like uh, Signal and everything like that, they're, they're okay, but I still think there's a, a strong central point of failure. Whereas if you can build something on Lightning for communications, then you remove those single points of failure and you actually get real robust, private decentralized chat. I guess like something for me as well that um, has personally uh, made me feel better. I, I was always quite interested in Lightning, but I did always have that concern that like, hey, you know, could some altcoin come along or whatever and get like a better market share and do this or that and, and be better for quicker payments. And so I, I guess when I first got involved in, the whole crypto world and uh years ago i was like hey this is a faster crypto than bitcoin you know i had that kind of view um but i guess something that's really helped for me is just seeing el salvador actually like as much as it's uh all over the place right now in the news and there's little bugs with the chivo app and things like that but on the side of that it's like we've seen that hey no matter what anyone says in any no coin altcoin whatever situation uh hey it, it's working pretty well now now that things are off the off the off the line people are turning it into dollars at, at, at atms or vice versa and people are buying things at mcdonald's and starbucks and whatever in el salvador so it's quite reassuring to see that happen um i don't know like what what because obviously when when el salvador was broken it was cool exciting and then you realize it's kind of being forced on the people and it feels a bit off and i don't know i didn't know what your opinions were on like that whole el salvador situation maybe not just i'm not trying to goad you into a political answer or anything but i didn't know what your opinions were on like how things have gone there and like how it makes you feel for the future of lightning and, and liquid and bitcoin in general i suppose yeah i think um their rollout of chivo may have been a bit rushed they could have probably done with some more time but <clears throat> i think the more important thing is to look at the the entire macro level of it, which is a nation state is adopting Bitcoin. Um, there's a lot of you know, complexities in that in and of itself, you know, like 
uh, I think at the launch, it was like mandated, like you must accept Bitcoin. And later on, it was changed, like, you know, it's optional. Um, but the, the important thing is it, it is legal tender and it sets that precedent and it enables more nation states to roll that out. But ultimately down the road, I don't think we need to concern ourselves as Bitcoiners with legal tender because the best money will always win. The freest money will always win. So, you know, legal tender is a nice thing right now. Um, it's cool. But at the end of the day, you know, in 50, 100 years, you don't need to have Bitcoin as legal tender. People will just accept Bitcoin because there's no other alternative. Like, why would you take something else? Just like today, if I try to pay you in seashells, like, would you would you accept that? I don't think so. <laughs> so it's just a no brainer. But you know, what El Salvador is doing is important. They're kind of kicking off that whole nation state adoption of Bitcoin, just like Michael Saylor kicked off, you know, corporate treasury adoption of Bitcoin. And all of these things are good for Bitcoin. And of course, there are hurdles with all of these things too. Like even uh, Michael Saylor and MicroStrategy, they got uh, uh, they got a lot of FUD when Bitcoin dropped. You know, people were saying, "Oh, he's failing" or whatever. But you know, I think they're looking at things on too short of a time horizon. They just have to, you know, learn to wait and be more patient and see. But it's all going in the right direction. I think it's all great for Bitcoin. Yeah, it's a good point you raise actually about legal tender because I guess my initial thoughts were always like, "Hey, it's annoying that." doing taxes is a pain up the backside when you're like getting paid in, in Bitcoin. And I, 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 I opt to get paid in USDT instead and then turn it into Bitcoin when I get it. Because for tax purposes, it's so much easier to just be like, boom, boom, you know, it makes life a whole lot easier. Um, so I guess like th there's that in my brain and also things like you can't pay your taxes in Bitcoin or, uh, you know, pay uh, your car, uh, road tax or insurance, or whatever. But then I guess, um, as you say, like the, 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 the best money, the freest money will, will win anyway. Um, it kind of makes me think of like, uh, it's safe Dean's book where he talks about, um, like how it kind of, you get that v v feeling that the government used to ask you like, Oh, please accept, you know, uh, pounds or dollars, uh, and, and give us your gold. And then now it's kind of the other way around, right. It's kind of like, you know, you're told, yeah, you're accepting it because you have to, or you're going to get chucked in prison or whatever. Um, so I guess like, uh, as you say, it kind of feels like you don't need the legal tender. You don't actually need the government to really say anything. If everyone in the UK, for example, just talking from home has Bitcoin and everyone in the UK wants to use Bitcoin, you're not going to turn them away, are you? Basically. So it becomes a kind of like mass overwhelming situation, like a bottom up rather than top down, like El Salvador. Um, yeah. so well, yeah. legal tender in itself is kind of a fiat concept, right? Like when we're, uh, when we're transacting in gold, no one had to make gold legal tender, right? We just know this thing is valuable. Uh, you know, God bless Peter Schiff, but <laughs> you know, in its heyday, gold was not made legal tender. It's just people use gold because you know it's gold. Yeah, basically, it's like an understanding of hey, this this is it's hard to make more. It's it looks super nice, <laughs> and also it's just uh, it, it derives its value from its uh, robustness as well. I guess right, like it's harder to to break down than other materials. Uh, and doesn't erode as quickly like if you see a gold coin on the road or a copper penny on the road the copper penny is usually defaced as hell by, by two days yeah. later um no it's just uh yeah it's a good point i, I guess i hadn't thought about the the, the lack of need uh, immediately for the government to say hey we don't you know you know to, this is legal tender we don't really need that anyway quite frankly um although it is encouraging with el salvador uh, did you have any further questions ricardo because i'm aware we're running towards i have an hour. one last two-part question because i know we're getting to the end um, do you have a magical crypto update and what's the next hat that you're going to make? Well, we stopped doing magical crypto. I think we all got really busy. Um, so there will be no more episodes unless we do like a special reunion episode <laughs> or something like that. Um, but yeah, like the, um, there's one more short we did animated short, but we never finished recording the voice over for it. So that's still sitting in the wings waiting to be released. I guess that's the only magical crypto update I have. Um, uh, next hat. Um, let's see. I did have fun staying poor. Uh, I was thinking of doing shadowy super coder next. I'm still thinking about what to do for it though, but I'll definitely send you guys that when when i have it well yeah i guess we we've run to the uh, to the end sadly um there's more things i probably would have liked to ask but maybe in the future someday uh we can we can have you back on um maybe when the the game fully launches actually that'd be kind of cool um you can even run us through it but, but appreciate you coming on and uh giving us your time it's been awesome to to chat to you uh, an honor 
and uh yeah just thank you very much um and thank you also to all those who've listened to the three of us talk uh today about bitcoin and games and exciting different things it's much appreciated um so yeah thanks once again and uh, to everyone out there have a lovely day evening morning week whatever it is wherever you are thanks ricardo thanks lawrence Thank you.